Uh, John chapter 4 in your Bible today. I know that we're a little bit limited, limited on time today, uh, but uh, I really don't care. Uh, no, no, I, 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 no I, I am sensitive to that. John, John chapter 4, and I want to show you an exciting passage in the Bible that I think will really be a blessing and a help to you. All the Bible is for all people. Now, not all the Bible is written to you, but all the Bible is written for you. Understand that distinction. Not all the Bible is written to you, but all the Bible is written for you. And the Bible says that as we read the Word of God, uh, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable. So every time you hear a message from God's Word, you want to be asking yourself the question, how is this profitable for my life, for my decision-making? And it, it wouldn't even be a bad idea every time that you hear a message to whisper just an inner prayer to the Lord, Lord, would you open my eyes? Would you show me things from your word that I need to see uh, that will help me live for you in a better way? He will answer that prayer. You know, the psalmist prayed that prayer. Open thou mine eyes, Lord, that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. We do know that the Holy Spirit of God who lives inside of believers. So if, you, if you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, the Holy Spirit of God lives in you. And we know the job of the Holy Spirit, in part, is to take the Word of God that's preached or taught or shared and to apply it to the heart of the child of God. So when you understand things, when God illuminates your, your understanding to His Word, that's the Holy Spirit helping you to understand so that you can behave more like, you can model the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. John chapter 4 is an exciting passage. I want to jump in at verse number 45. If you look at it, John chapter 4, and look all the way at the end of the chapter to verse number 45, and watch what the Bible says. Uh, then, verse 45, then when he was come into Galilee, all right, so stop for a moment, just so everyone is on the same sheet of music. Jesus really was raised in Galilee. When you think about Galilee in the Bible, it's a region. Like we would say Virginia is a region, and we would say we're in the locality of Spotsylvania or Fredericksburg, okay? But the re so Galilee is a region. Many cities, many villages in Galilee, but Galilee is kind of a rural place. So if you picture a Bible map, the Galilee is all around the region of the Sea of Galilee. So if you picture a map of Israel, you've got the Sea of Galilee, which is just a lake, really. It's 13 miles uh, north and south, eight miles at its widest, east and west. Not a big body of water, but the Sea of Galilee, the Jordan River that comes down from the Sea of Galilee, and then you picture maybe the Dead Sea. So down here by the Dead Sea, that's the region we call Judea. In the, Bible, in the ministry of Jesus, Judea. That's where most of the religious people lived. That's where most of the population was. The people from Judea kind of looked down on the people of Galilee. It'd be kind of like, this is Virginia, and this is West Virginia, okay? Kind of like that. Uh, honestly, they, they looked at them as the country folk. And, but Jesus was from Galilee. And Jesus was raised in a town called Nazareth, which was just a little village of 300 people in uh, Galilee. Jesus didn't begin his public ministry until he was 30. Uh, understand that most of the time that Jesus was on planet Earth, people didn't know who he was. Uh, except for his town, except for his family, people just didn't know him. It took his baptism by John the Baptist to inaugurate his public ministry, and then Jesus began to preach, and then Jesus began to do miracles and all of that. So Jesus now, in John 4, has been down in Judea at the early part of his ministry for four months. For four months, he's been then down in Judea. He's made his way north. He's come through Samaria, which is right between the two. The Samaritans and the Jews did not get along. But now he's back in Galilee. Galilee. Matter of fact, not only is he back in Galilee, he's back in the very village where he performed his first miracle. Now, you probably know this, but the first miracle that Jesus ever performed in his public ministry was the changing of the water to the wine. And that took place in Cana. So now Jesus is all the way back in Cana. And here's what happened. In the meantime, the people of Galilee have gone down to Judea to attend a feast. 
And at that feast, they've seen Jesus. And they saw Jesus do some amazing things. One thing they saw Jesus do is they, they saw him chase out all the, the money changers. They saw him cha- uh, up, to, up uh, turn the tables of those that were selling turtle doves and take these things hence and make not my father's house a house of merchandise. They saw that. And then also the Bible says in John 2, they saw him do some unrecorded miracles. The Bible didn't tell us what the miracles were, but Jesus did some miracles and people saw that. People are thinking, wow, who is this? What's going on? He's from our area. Uh, They've heard about the miracle of changing the water to the wine. So people are really eager for Jesus to come home. Why? Not because they're looking for a Messiah. They're eager for Jesus to come home because they're looking for a miracle. They're really not intent upon obeying Jesus or following Jesus. They really just want to see a miracle and they want good things to happen to them. I'm afraid sometimes that's the way we view Jesus, not as our sovereign, not as someone that we want to be Lord of our life or tell us what to do, but somebody that can help us when we have a problem. And so Jesus is going to teach a very important principle here in John chapter four. Look at it in verse number 45. So then... When he was coming into Galilee, the Galileans received him, but, but just superficially. The Bible says they, they saw all the things that he had done, that he did in Jerusalem at the feast, for they also went to the feast. Now, specifically, watch what happens in verse 46. So Jesus came again into Cana of Galilee, where he made the water wine, and, so here's the story I want us to consider. And there was a certain nobleman, We're going to talk about who was he. There was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. Okay, so here's a certain nobleman. We're going to find out why did he come to Jesus. Well, we came to Jesus because he has this problem. And this problem is so big that he can't solve it any other way. And the only answer he has left, the desperate need that he has, is his son is sick at the point of death. Look at verse number 47. When he had heard that Jesus was come out of Judea into Galilee, he went unto him and besought him that he would come down and heal his son. Now watch it. For he, the son, was at the point of death. Okay, so there's the problem. It is a grave problem. It is a desperate problem. And this problem is what has brought this man to Jesus. Now look at verse number 48. Then said Jesus unto him, Now, this would not be the way you would expect for Jesus to answer a desperate prayer like the man had. But watch what Jesus says, verse 48. Except ye see signs and wonders, ye will not believe. Now, you're just here because you want to see signs and wonders. All you people, the only reason you're here is because you want to see a miracle worker. You want some big thing to happen. You don't really believe on me because of who I am. You don't really believe on me because of what I say. You'll only believe on me if I can do something big for you. That's what he's saying. Now look at verse number uh, 49. The nobleman saith unto him, Sir, come down ere my child die. So uh, Lord, I don't know what you're saying to everybody else. That may be true. But Lord, all I know is I have a sick son. I know he's about to die. And I know if you don't help, it's not going to go well. So, Lord, would you please come right now, leave right now, come with me right now, and let's go back to my son, heal my son. Now, look at verse number 50. So Jesus saith unto him, go thy way. I'm not going to come with you. Go thy way, thy son liveth. So Jesus healed him on the spot. Now, could he see that? No. In order for that man to believe that Jesus healed his son, he was just going to have to do that, believe that Jesus healed his son based upon not anything he could see, but based upon what Jesus said. Do you know that Jesus wants you to live your life not based upon what you can see him do? Jesus wants to live your life based upon what he says. That's why he's left us his word. Because he wants our word to be foundation. He wants our life, rather, to be foundation on his word. If we're not careful, we'll become just like the people of Jesus' day, where our life is not really foundation on the word of God. We really don't have faith in who he is and what he says. We have faith in what we can see and how things work out and what God can make happen. Look at verse number 50 again. 
So Jesus saith unto him, Go thy way, thy son liveth. And the man believed the word. That's exactly what Jesus was after. The man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him, and he went his way. And as he was now going down, his servants met him. So he's going back home. But as he's going back home, his household servants have now discovered that the son was healed at the very moment Jesus said. So they're on their way out to meet him, to tell him. Now, they don't know he's coming back. Uh, they, for all they know, he's still in Cana. So they're just going to find Jesus, uh, to find the man to tell him that, th that their son has been healed. They don't even know why he's healed. They don't know how it happened. So they go, the Bible says, in verse 51, and they told him, thy son liveth. Verse 52. Then inquired he of them the hour. When? When did that happen? He inquired of them the hour. The hour when he began to amend. And they said unto him, yesterday at the seventh hour. So the seventh hour, they count the day beginning at 6 a.m. So 6 a.m. add seven hours. It's one o'clock in the afternoon. So yesterday at one o'clock, that's when he got better. Yesterday at the seventh hour, the Bible says, and the fever left him. So, don't miss it, verse 53, so the father knew. He knew that it was the same hour in which Jesus said to him, thy son liveth. And himself believed. So what was the result? Dad believed. And his whole house believed. Verse 54. This is, again, the second miracle that Jesus did when he was come out of Judea into Galilee. Hey, we don't have a whole lot of time, but I want to talk to you for just a couple minutes on this topic, the point of death. The point of death. You know, sometimes God brings situations in our life that are point of death situations. Like we literally faced that as a family about 10 years ago when my dad was at the point of death. He had cancer. He had attended my son Nathaniel's wedding 10 and a half years ago. We didn't think he could make it. He, he did make it to the wedding, but he could only make it for the first 15 minutes. Had to go back to the hotel room. He was in bad shape. He went back home to Connecticut and they got a hospital bed and he just went in that hospital bed at home. And some of you have dealt with this. My mother called us and said, we're going to have a surprise birthday party for, for dad. This will probably be the last birthday he lives. As a matter of fact, the doctors have said it's probably just a matter of weeks right now. I'll never forget getting in the car with my wife and our three unmarried children and now my newly married son and the Seven of us made our way back to Connecticut to say goodbye to my dad. We went back. It was a surprise birthday party and it didn't feel like a birthday party. All the birthday festivities were downstairs, but my dad couldn't come downstairs. He was so sick in bed, he just had to stay upstairs. And every few minutes, another group would go up and talk to my dad, pray with him, laugh, talk, reminisce. I'll never forget the day that we had to go back to Pennsylvania and the seven of us, my, my wife and I and my older son and his wife and our three other children, we gathered around, we prayed together. I looked at my dad and I said goodbye. And I thought that that was it. And I just talked to him yesterday. <laughs> I just talked to him yesterday. You know, God did a, an incredible miracle. God answered some prayers that we just were astounded by. And 10 years later, despite what every doctor said, despite what all the, uh, all the uh, predictions were, he's still here among us. And we thank God for that. I remember going to a hospital 20 years ago, a man by the name of Jack in our church, a faithful man in his early 60s. His children called me and said, Pastor, it doesn't look good. I rushed down to the hospital, Presbyterian Hospital in Pittsburgh and we sat there by his bedside all night long. About one or two o'clock in the morning, they finally made the decision. I, th I think we just need to turn off the ventilator. He's not gonna, he's not gonna live. The doctor said it's, it's, it's the right choice. And we prayed and sure enough, we turned the ventilator off and we fully expected to have our hands held together and pray together and expected to usher him into heaven. But you know, 15 minutes went by and then a half hour and then an hour and two hours, and finally I said, guys, uh, I'm going to go home, get some sleep, 
you know, keep me posted. And I went home and slept for about four or five hours. I woke up, I got a text. How's he doing? Oh, he's, he's still doing well. He's, as a matter of fact, his vital signs are holding steady. He's getting a little bit stronger. You know, Jack lived another 20 years. I said, Jack, you wasted a whole night of my life that night. <laughs> I'd, I'd see him at church. They said, Jack, you were supposed to die. You were supposed to die. You know, sometimes God has plans other than the plans that we have. And it's all his grace. It's all his grace. But it doesn't always work out that way. It doesn't always work out that way. Sometimes you do shut the ventilator off. And sometimes that is the, the, the time when they go. And sometimes you do go say your last goodbyes. It didn't always work out that way. And I can give you stories that will illustrate the other way as well. All I do know is that this man in John chapter 4 was in a situation where no doubt he had exhausted every resource he had. The Bible calls him a nobleman. That means he was a a government official. And as such, he probably was despised by Jewish people because he was cooperating with the Roman government. He was cooperating with those that were occupying Israel. Uh, No doubt uh, he was a kind of a pariah when it came to religious leaders, and he was a pariah when it came to the Pharisees and the Sadducees of the day, but but he needed help. And no doubt he had resources as a government official. He he had household servants. He he was a man of means. He was a man of of influence. Uh, There's no doubt in my mind that he he had exhausted all of the resources of specialists and and doctors and and the money and all the things that, that resources and influence can do, but nothing helped. You know why? Because trials in our life are the great equalizer. Rich people get sick and poor people get sick. And rich people get cancer and poor people get cancer. And uh, trials are the great equalizer. James talked about that in James chapter 1. When he said, let the uh, brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted. Trials exalt a poor man. Because a, a trial to a poor man says, God is interested enough in your life to use trials to make you more like Jesus. And then uh, a trial in a rich man's life brings him low and realizes it makes no difference how much you have and uh, what resources are yours. Uh, but uh, trials bring you low. That They're the great equalizer. And this man was equalized in his life by this trial. He had no place left to turn. And now he goes to a Jewish rabbi. He's heard about this Jesus. He goes to a Jewish rabbi with this intense problem. I need help. I'm desperate. Please help me. And watch what he says in verse number 47. He heard that Jesus was come out of Judea into Galilee. He went unto him and besought him that he would come down and heal his son because he was at the point of death. Why is it often in life that it takes point of death experiences to bring us to Jesus? Why is it so often in life that it takes the desperate situations to make us finally look to Jesus who ought to be our first resource and often becomes our last? Maybe that's one of the reasons why Jesus said, except you see signs and wonders, why are you really here? Are you here just because you you want me to be your fix-it-up person? Are you here just because uh, uh, I'm your last ditch? Are you here just because I'm some kind of a genie in the sky and you can rub the magic lamp and I'll solve your problem for today and forget forget about me tomorrow? Is that who I am in your life? He said to the crowd, I think there's much we can learn from this man that came to Jesus, a purification of his motives. Why are you there? What is your problem? And what is the real problem? Because a lot of times the problem that you think you have and the point of death situation that you think you're dealing with really is just the harbinger of a bigger problem you have in your life that you are not yet aware of. See, the biggest problem in this person's life was that uh, he did not have faith and trust in Jesus Christ. He didn't know Messiah. He didn't know the Son of God. And we know the purpose of the book of John is to point to Jesus. This man thought that his problem was his son, but really his problem was his own heart. And while his son problem was solved, the, the heart problem was the bigger problem that was solved as well. Now, you've got a problem today, and so do I. It's a problem of our heart. What pleases God is faith. And God allows things in our life to bring us to places of desperation so that our only option is him, so we can put our faith and trust not in what we see him do, but faith and trust in what he's tell, who he's told us he is, his person, his word. God wants you to have faith in his word this morning. And so we see not only who this person was and what problem he had in verses 40. 6 and 47, but watch how Jesus responds. Would you look at verse number 48? You might find this 
Interesting, Jesus often in the Bible does not respond the way that you would think he'd respond. We have kind of a, a, a script in our mind about how God should respond to our problems. And it goes like this, immediately, right? And in the way that we suggest he should. Matter of fact, if Jesus would just operate on our timetable and by our, and by, and, and by our script, everything would be just fine. I mean, if Jesus would just fill the prescription that we give him, when we give it to him, then life would not have any problems, right? We would be so much better off if Jesus could just be convinced to do it our way. Watch what happens here in verse number 48, how Jesus responds. Then said Jesus unto him, now watch him, that's singular, except ye, that's plural. So Jesus is speaking to the man, but he's really speaking to the crowd. Because the lesson that Jesus is given is a a lesson that he's using this man to teach, but the lesson is for everybody, including you and me. We're in that crowd. And the Bible says, except ye see signs and wonders, ye will not believe. I think what Jesus is saying is, are are you going to trust me as a consequence of seeing a miracle? Or do you want to see a miracle as a consequence of trusting me? What comes first, the faith or the miracle? What came first in your salvation? Faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. The just shall live by faith. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. You've not seen heaven. You've not seen eternity. You've not seen the future that God's prepared, the heavenly mansion that he's gone to prepare a place for you. None of it. But you trust him. Faith precedes the miracle. Uh, Jesus is looking to introduce himself to you and what he can give you by faith. And so how did Jesus respond? I think, first of all, he responded by qualifying the reason for coming. Is he just the bread king? Is he just the genie in the sky? Why are you coming to Jesus? Think about how this man came to Jesus. Jesus, I've got this problem. This problem has brought me to you, and I've got the solution to this problem. Come down now, right now, and heal my son. So this man had this this, this script in his mind about how Jesus would help him. Jesus, you need to come now. So the timetable was immediacy. And you need to come down to my house because never in all of the the record of the Bible had any miracle ever been done when the miracle worker was 20 miles away. So how would this man think think otherwise? My son is sick. I need Jesus to come be where he is so he can touch him, so he can see him, so he can heal him. Because he's operating on what he knows. All I know is that if he gets down to where my son is, that's my hope that he'll heal him. So I need you to come down and be with my son now, Capernaum was at least 20 miles away. I've actually made this hike. I've actually walked from Cana to Capernaum. I've walked, I've walked this road. It's a long road. So what's the man thinking? The man's thinking, well, it's going to take at least a day, usually longer, but if you really huff it, uh, uh, and it's really, really uh, important, maybe you can make it in a day without stopping. And so uh, if Jesus, if you'll come down to where my son is, then you can heal him tomorrow. So the best case scenario that this guy had was for Jesus to leave the crowd, to go exactly where his son was, and maybe tomorrow, if my son continues to live for another day, maybe he'll be healed. That was the best case scenario he could come up with, which leads me to my second point about how Jesus responded. How did Jesus respond? I think, first of all, he qualified the response. Why are you here? Are you here just to, are you here because I'm just a, 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 a retail commodity? And you just come and I dole out what you need and you go your way? Are you here to put faith in me? Are you here just for a sign? Are you here just for a wonder? Are you here just for a wow? Are you here for a message? Are you here for me? Are you here for my mission? Why are you here? I think Jesus asks you that question. I think when we have point of death situations in our life, and maybe it's a relationship in your life that's at the point of death. Maybe it's a physical need in your life. Maybe it's, a, maybe it's an actual a physical uh, uh, 
a, a loved one or yourself. But why do we come to Jesus? Is it just for Jesus to dole out an answer in the moment? Or do we really want to know what his purpose is? Do we really want to know him? Do we really want to know why we're here? Do we really want to live by faith? So he qualifies the response. But then number two, he answered, don't miss this. He answered the what. He answered the what of his request without honoring the how of his request. And God often does that. He answered the what of his request without honoring the how of his request. So what was his request? Heal my son. That's a simple request. I'm desperate. I need my son to be healed. Heal, please, Lord. I'm begging you. That's what the word literally means. I'm begging you. I'm in no position to bargain. This is merely your grace that will do this. Oh, Jesus, please. And here's how I want you to do it. Come with me. Come with me, and tomorrow when we get there, it'll happen. So he suggested the what, and then he also suggested the how. Jesus answered the what without honoring the how. Why? Because the real need that this man had was not for his son to be healed. Because what good is healing if you die and spend eternity without God? What good is a temporary physical miracle in your life if you don't know the God that that performed the miracle? If God is just the dispenser and he's never the person you have a relationship with. So what Jesus was fertilizing in his life was faith. Did it ever occur to you that maybe what God is doing in your life right now with your point of death problem that you want God to take away immediately? then maybe what God is doing in your life is fertilizing your faith. Because your faith is a whole lot more important to God than your comfort. It's a whole lot more important. So what does God do? God the Son, he answers the request without honoring the how. He said, okay, your son is healed. Now put yourself in that man's position. He already has his preconception about how God does things. He doesn't have any historical precedence about anybody ever being healed long distance. So he goes to Jesus and says, Jesus, would you please come? You can change water to wine. You can can do miracles. We saw it down in Jerusalem. So just come down to my place and do the miracle. I'm not going to ask you to stay long. Jesus said, okay, I'll do the miracle. Your son's healed. See, in order for him to believe that, He has to put his trust not in something he can see. He has to put his trust in something that Jesus said. All of his faith has to be in the word of the person. The character of Jesus as demonstrated by the word that he speaks. The character of God as demonstrated by the word that he has left us. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. God's primary concern for you in your daily life is that you would trust what he says. Even though it goes against what you might see, even though it goes against what you might think, even though it's counterintuitive to what, the way you might want to respond, trust what he says. And so what does this man do? Watch this. He leaves Jesus and begins walking away from the person whom he thought was the answer. He thought the answer was him coming with him. And every step he makes back toward the house, he's walking away from Jesus. But trusting what Jesus said. I'm going to trust that when he said he's healed, I've never seen it before. The only thing I have to go on is not history. It's not other person's testimony. The only thing I have to go on is his word. That's the only thing I can trust right now. And he does. And it's not just a mental ascent trust. No, it's a shoe leather trust because he's taking every step away from Jesus going home. This is his only hope. Do you know that Jesus does that in your life too? He answers the what often without answering the how. Lord, heal my grandma. 
And sometimes grandma dies. And you're like, Lord, you didn't do it. No, you told them how to do it. You told them how to do it. You know, he did do it. Matter of fact, grandma would tell you she didn't want to be back. Grandma's like, quit praying for me to get off, you know, quit praying for me to come home in a wheelchair. I'm walking on streets of gold. But in our limited non-faith life, we want the what to be our how. Lord, draw me closer to you. And so he gives a big, huge, colossal problem in your life. And you're like, Lord, that's not what I meant. But are you closer to him? Are you praying more? Are you more dependent? Are your priorities better aligned? Yes, 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 yes. So he did answer your what, didn't he? He just didn't answer your how. Faith says, God, I'm more concerned about who you are and what you say than the way that you do it in my life. It's the immature Christian that has to have his way. Lord, I want you and your will and your what, not my way. And so Jesus did answer the what. He just didn't honor the how. Now watch this lastly this morning. I hope this is making sense. We saw who this man was. We saw why he came. We saw how Jesus responded. But let me ask, uh, answer one last question for us this morning. Then what were the results? and What can we learn from it? So what happened then? What, what happened? This man believed Jesus. What a step of faith. What steps of faith they were that he would walk away from a Can- Cana, walk all the way up. I've, I've been on this trail all the way up to a place called the Horns of Hattin. And, and at the top of that, you look down and there's Capernaum way, way, way down in the distance. And you have to walk down, 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 down. The Sea of Galilee is 600 feet below sea level. Down, down. And no doubt he's thinking, oh my, is this going to work? Uh, Lord, I'm trusting what you said, but... And somewhere outside of the city of Capernaum, those servants said, we can't wait for him any longer. We don't know how long he's going to be gone. Somebody's got to go tell him. They sent out a delegation with the house to say, hey, your son is better. Your son is better. So ha- what, what happened? What were the results? And how, what does that mean for me? Well, how, does that, how does that relate to you and me? Look at what it says now in closing. Verse number 53. Verse number 51, I should say. And as they were now going down, his servants met him, told him, Thy son liveth. That then inquired he of them, the hour. When? When? I want to make sure this is not just a coincidence. Because he told me yesterday at one o'clock that my son was, was healed. That's when he told me. So I want, to, I want to match this up. The Bible says in verse number 52, And they said unto him, Yesterday, at the exact same time that Jesus told you, at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So the father knew. What happened? What can we learn? We can learn this. When we totally depend on Jesus, our faith is strengthened and deepened. When God brings point of death situations in your life, when you have no answers, And your resources and your influence and your manipulation and your friend group is not enough. When Jesus, when God allows point of death situations in your life, when your only answer is him, those are times when your faith can be strengthened and deepened. Because it's only you going into the operating room. It's only you dealing with the loss of betrayal. It's only you. And so when God puts you in those point of death situations in your life, He is strengthening. He's not doing something to you. He's doing something for you. And your own faith is strengthened and deepened. This man went from a faith in healing to a faith in the healer. He went from faith in what Jesus could do temporarily into faith in what Jesus could do permanently. This was when he put his faith and trust in the person of Messiah. His faith was deepened and strengthened. 
But not only was his faith deep and strengthened, number two, when we totally depend upon him, our testimony strengthens others because we don't live on an island. You live in a community of people. You live in a family. You live in a church family. You live in a workplace. And when you're going through your point of death experience in your life and and you're you're forced to trust God and God alone and and you're trying to operate by faith, other people take notice of that. And what's happening here is uh, this testimony of this man uh, spilled out and his whole household heard the story. Yeah, I went to Jesus and here's what he said and and I trusted him and I came back and it all happened. Wow, we're going to believe on him too. We've never seen him. We didn't hear his word, but we heard you give his word. It's like the people in Samaria. They, didn't, they weren't there at the well, but they were so convinced that she was convinced. It's like the people of Decapolis. They, they weren't there by the seaside when the maniac of Gadara was healed, but they were convinced that he was convinced. Who's convinced that you're convinced? How has your faith sparked others to believe? Well, i tell you what. When we totally depend upon God, when God puts us in these point of death experiences, our testimony strengthens others. Uh, the, himself, the, the servants, the Galileans themselves, no doubt they got the news back, us today in Fredericksburg, Virginia, 2,000 years later, we're strengthened by it. Hey, do you know this? There was another guy in this same town, the same town where this guy lived, the nobleman. And he was a centurion who was also a Roman officer. And so the nobleman, who was a Roman government official, and the centurion, who was a Roman government official, no doubt knew each other. No doubt they interacted. And the centurion, a little bit later on, he had a problem too, not with his son, but with a servant. And the servant in the centurion's home was sick and at the point of death. And so guess what the centurion did? He sent for Jesus. Jesus, would you please come and heal my servant? And remember, yeah, Jesus was starting to come. And then the centurion said, you know what? Don't bother coming. Just give the word and my servant will be healed. Where did he learn that? Where did he learn that Jesus can heal without even being there? Where did he learn? He learned it from this. Do you understand? You are teaching people right now. You're not saying a word. You're teaching people right now. You're not behind a pulpit. You're teaching people right now. You've never uh, wielded a microphone, but you're teaching people right now through your trial, through your problem. When you trust God, your testimony is strengthening others. That's what's happening here. When we totally depend upon God, it strengthens and deepens our own faith. When we totally depend upon God, when God puts us in those unpalatable situations, our testimony can be used to strengthen other people. But then lastly, this morning, most importantly, most importantly, when we totally depend upon God, we point to Jesus as the answer for everything, especially the main thing. Let me say it again. When we totally trust in God, I'm talking about in your situation and your problem right now, When you totally trust him, your faith is in him, you're trusting his word, then what you're actually doing is you're becoming a, a human arrow. And you're pointing to Jesus, who is the answer for everything, but especially the main thing. Now, now don't miss this. Why did John include this story in the book of John? Can I tell you why? Because he told us why. Because in John chapter 20 and verse 31, he said, there's many things I could have written about. And I could fill a library with the things. Matter of fact, it would spill out of that library. The libraries of the world couldn't hold it. But I specifically chose a few things to include for this reason. I wanted the things that I included to point people to Jesus as the Son of God. And when they understood that he was the Son of God, I wanted them to believe on him because there's life in his name. In other words, I included this story because this story points to Jesus. Can I just say this? In your point of death situation in your life, and it might not be physical that I'm talking about your problem. Can you ask the Lord in a in a concrete way, if he would just allow your life 
your testimony, your faith in him to be an arrow that would point other people like a sign. That's what it literally is, a sign. A sign to say, Jesus is real. Jesus is alive. You can trust him too. That's what your situation is supposed to teach in these three ways. Here they are. Number one, desperate situations limit our options. So when you show people that you're trusting God and God alone, you're showing, hey, desperate situations limit our options. The most desperate situation you face is you're going to die and go to hell without Jesus. And there's nothing you can do about it. The most desperate situation any person can ever, uh, ever encounter is there is no hope of eternal salvation outside of Jesus Christ. No religion, no church, no priest, no rabbi, no imam, no nobody can get you to heaven other than Jesus. You are in a desperate situation. Desperate situations limit our options. Number two, faith precedes the results that you will see. And so we have to trust what he said. We have to trust what his word says. We have to trust uh, his character. One day we will see heaven. One day we will see Jesus. It will be worth it all. But for now, we've got to trust what he said. And this story points to that. Desperate situations. Limited options. Faith precedes the results that we hope for. And then lastly, Jesus doesn't have to physically be there to do the work. Is Jesus physically here today? No. No, by his spirit, he's here with two or three gathered together. There am I in the midst. We get it. Law, I'm with you always. I understand all that. But physically, Jesus is not here. If Jesus were here physically, I wouldn't be standing here. He'd be standing here. I'd be sitting down there taking notes. Right? But Jesus is here. And Jesus can do for you today something where he's not even physically present. He can save you. And your situation points people to those realities. So take heart, my friend. Things aren't just happening to you. You're not just having a bad day. It's not like God just kind of took some time off and he's going to rescue you after he's done with vacation. No, he loves you. He has a purpose in all of it. And you have the opportunity in your situation to point people to Jesus Christ.